This problem involves what's called a twin T network. It's a passive RC network <clears throat> where we have two T's. We have a T here bridged by another T here, hence the name twin T. The problem is, is given that we have two capacitors in this leg of equal value C and two resistors in this leg of equal value R and two unknown RX and RC capacitors and we have a load resistor at the output and we're driving the input with some voltage, AC voltage uh, V1. This is going to be an AC network problem. <clears throat> the question is what do the values of Rx and Cx need to be in terms of R and C <clears throat> so that the output voltage is zero? There's a relationship between Rx and, and Cx with respect to R and C of these two legs in which the voltage will null out. It will go to zero. This is called a notch filter. That the output will go to zero and at what frequency will it go to zero. What is the relationship in RxCx to make the output zero and at what frequency does that occur at? <clears throat> now it turns out it's independent of RL. So you can first assume it's much easier to solve when RL uh, is infinity and the circuit isn't loaded. <clears throat> the null is determined by the numerator polynomial of the transfer function. Um, I just give you a little bit of basics here. If we ratio the output voltage to the input voltage, this is called a transfer function. In the S domain, this is some H of S. If you're dealing with phasors, this will be H of uh, omega or j omega. And you'll have some numerator polynomial in S and a denominator polynomial of S. The denominator polynomial we call the system function. And it is dependent on RL, the loading of the network. However, the numerator polynomial is not. It's independent of RL. <clears throat> the system function is a characteristic of the dead network. If I take all independent sources, set them to zero by replacing them with their internal impedance, the dead network determines the characteristic of the denominator polynomial or the system function. The zeros or the roots of D of S are called the poles of the network. And the zeros or the roots of the numerator polynomial are called the zeros of the network. <clears throat> With proper choice of Rx and Cx, this transfer function has this form. I'll give you a little hint here. It's third order network, both in the numerator and in the denominator. If I let um, x equal, this should be h of x, if I let x <clears throat> be SRC, where s is complex frequency, or the Laplace frequency, the Laplace variable s, if I let x equal RC, the system, system transfer function will have this form. <clears throat> well, it turns out that these can be factored x cubed x squared plus x plus 1 can be factored as x plus 1 over x squared plus 1. And the denominator can be factored as x plus 1 over x squared plus 4x plus 1. And notice what happens here. We get what's called a pole zero cancellation. Well, we have a zero 
at x equals minus 1, we have a pole at x equals minus 1. They cancel and it behaves as a second order network. <clears throat> what this means is that if you were to look in the S plane or the pole zero constellation for this network that we will end up this can be factored into x <coughs> um, uh, x minus i and x plus i which tells us we have two zeros on the j omega axis if this is the real axis we're in the complex plane and this is the imaginary axis at j1 and minus j1 we have our zeros and if you're to uh, look at this this are our poles that's out at you mark poles by x's and these are at 40.89 degrees with a magnitude of square root of 7. <clears throat> and we have a pole at minus 1, but we also have a 0 there, right on top of it, so they cancel. Now what this means is that the fact that we have a zero on the j omega axis means that at this frequency the response goes to zero because as we make s go to j omega like we do when we do for Bode plots and AC analysis as we vary the frequency omega our omega is moving up the j omega axis and it encounters a zero and it goes to zero the volt response is zero so, the fact that we have two zeros on the j omega axis means that the response nulls out and goes to zero. <clears throat> now, when RL is not infinite, what happens is the pole and the zeros move apart. The zero is always at minus one, but the pole moves away, so you don't end up with cancellation. But it doesn't affect the null because the null is determined by two zeros sitting here on the j omega axis. So it doesn't matter where this pole moves. This single pole has to move along the real and negative real axis. It can't go up into the plane. Any poles that occur that move off into the plane have to occur in pairs. And this does not have a pair, so it has to lie along the j omega axis, or lie along the negative real axis. So it only goes back and forth here. It doesn't affect the nulling response, the frequency or the depth of the null. <clears throat> now, so what you have to do is solve for this transfer function in order to find the relationship on Rx and Cx so that this response goes to zero. You want that response to go to zero <clears throat> and you need to determine that. Now, I'll give you a hint here. I'll help you out. I'm going to give you the flow graph for this. And if you know anything about Mason's game formula, you can calculate the response and compare it to what you get using some sort of AC analysis technique, either node voltages or mesh currents or some other loop current methods or transformations, however you want to do it. Doesn't matter. So, here's our network. What this means is this is a common 
common ground, common node, okay, on, on the network. So here's our load, RL. All right, the graph for this can be written in this fashion. I'm not going to go through how I derive this. I'm just going to give you the results. It's fairly straightforward. It's actually really quite easy with the methods that I've developed on uh, graph theory. Here's our V out. Here's our V in. These are our gain paths. And we have two feedback paths from V out. What um, <clears throat> we're looking at here is this is node X, say this is node Y, so this is our node X, this is our node Y. So you can kind of see the graph there from V1 to X, we're going through a capacitor, from X to V out, we're going through another capacitor, and then from V1 to Y, we're going this way, and from Y to the output, we're going here. But then the outputs also feed back through this capacitor to X, and uh, from the output it feeds back to node Y through R. I will call this gain 1, gain 2, gain 5, gain 4, gain 3, and gain 6. The values for the gains are G1 is 1 over 2 plus SRCX, gain 2 is SCRX over 1 plus 2 SCRX, gain 3 is 1 over 1 plus SRC, Gain 4 is SRC over 1 plus SRC. Gain 5 is SRXC over 1 plus 2SCRX. And gain 6 is 1 over 2 plus S R C X. So those are your six gains for uh, the flow graph and you can use Mason's gain formula for getting the transfer function to check with what you got. Uh, this is AC voltage source here or V1. Just check to make sure that they're correct here. Okay, I haven't made any mistakes. So there, there you go. That's the um, uh, question. Is uh, find the um, the values for Rx and Cx that gives you a null at a particular frequency. I'll let you look at that. And then I'm going to make a quick comment here regarding this network. There's um, an interesting uh, circuit. If you put an amplifier in to bootstrap the network, you get a uh, very interesting result. I'll just show you that schematic very quickly. I'm going to take the original twin T Yeah, I've just flipped it upside down. Doesn't really matter. I've redrawn the network. You'll see this is completely equivalent. what we had before. There's my ground connection, common ground. And here's V1. We're driving it with some voltage source. 
Now, this circuit, this passive circuit, if you were to do a frequency response plot on it, frequency or magnitude of V out over V1 versus frequency, what you'll find that'll happen when the Rx and Cx are appropriately chosen, your response will go like this. And you get a null at some frequency called omega zero. That's a function of R and C and the choices you make for Rx and Cx. And this is called a null network. And this is the twin T. Now, if I add an amplifier to this network to bootstrap up the output or bootstrap this node from the output, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an amp. I'm no longer going to tie this node to ground. I'm going to connect the output through an amplifier with gain K, positive gain K, to that node and bootstrap it up from the output. I'm taking some output and feeding it back into the network. And what happens is if you look at the pole zero plot, the zeros are still on the J omega axis, but what happens is the poles that were out here at 40.89 degrees move as you adjust the K. And they move in a direction towards the zeros. And in fact, you can adjust it so they lay right on top of the zeros. But you don't want to lay them on top of the zeros to get cancellation. But you want them to get arbitrarily close to the zero. And what that happens is as you these poles move, this null moves in like this. And when you're just about on top of the poles, you get a very sharp null with very little bandwidth in there. That thing just drops right down to the center of the earth and really nulls things out. So in a sense, you can use this to null out an unwanted frequency. In fact, I use this a lot to null out 60 hertz null, hum on um, amplifier circuits in audio range. Is It's going to affect, you can get this so close that this is only a few hertz wide and you won't notice that the null is there or that there's a hole in your frequency response. But it'll really get rid of that 60 hertz. It'll just take it right out to nothing. So anyway, that's a practical application of that particular network. So good luck and uh, give your comments. I'll wait a while, I'll maybe wait a month for uh, before I uh, go through and post a solution to this. So, give you plenty of time to work on it.